Hello and welcome to this presentation on the spectrum analysis process. Now, spectrum analysis is a topic that we obviously can't cover in any you know, quick presentation like this. What we're going to focus on is a series of steps that will help you determine if there's a fault condition and what the fault is and how severe it is, but we're obviously just in a, in a brief form. First, we'll have a look at what are your spectrum analysis goals. You know, first, you're trying to determine if there is a possibility of a fault. Hopefully, if you've got your alarm, can, uh, alarm limits set up properly and you can compare the spectra to baseline spectra, you should be able to tell if there's been much variation in the vibration. If there's been no variation, then hopefully you can just move on. If the amplitudes are all very low, hopefully you can move on. But as soon as you are suspicious that there could be a fault condition, then we need to go to the next step. We need to diagnose that fault condition. But as part of that process, we might decide that we need to use phase to help us be really sure what's wrong with the machine. Uh, time waveform analysis, demodulation, enveloping, peak view, shock pulse, etc. Uh, we might compare spectra to different axes at a point, different points on the machine, even different machines to be able to tell what's normal and what's not. Once we've gone through that process, it is important to determine the severity and the nature of the fault condition. When you give that report, people want to know what is wrong with the machine, what do I have to do about it, and how important is it that I act soon? In other words, when do I have to take action? And last but certainly not least, you need to investigate the root cause. You need to look at all your data and try to figure out why did this fault develop? And what could we do so that the fault doesn't develop again in the future? So, let's take a look. Very briefly, the process is after you've sort of verified the, that the data is okay, you're going to identify the 1x peak in the spectrum. And I would always argue to look at the spectra order normalized with the x-axis in orders rather than Hertz or CPM. Then I can look at the amplitude of the 1x peak and 2x and 3x and even 4x and 5x and depending on how they all look, that will send me off in one direction. Uh, I may use phase to help me diagnose faults that can all give me changes in amplitude in that area. Then I'm going to look at forcing frequencies. What is my pump vein rate or my blade pass rate or my gear mesh frequency or you know these known frequencies that I should hopefully have recorded that I can look in the spectrum and then start to investigate the vibration from that point of view. Once I've done that, and I'm happy still at this point that there's no faults, that should leave me with peaks in the spectrum that I can't explain. Now, if the peaks have a reasonable amplitude, you're going to look at, well, certainly those peaks could relate to harmonics and sidebands, but hopefully you've considered them already. Now I'm going to look at, you know, are those peaks synchronous, non-synchronous, sub-synchronous? Um, what's the noise floor doing? Are there harmonics? Are there sidebands? And so on. So I look at the 1x, 2x, etc. Then I look at the forcing frequencies. Then I see what's left. And hopefully you've got reasonable analysis tools that makes this process a bit easier. I'll go through an example in a moment, um, but we'll go through the sequence in a bit more detail first. So, number one, we need to verify the data. No ski slopes, no nasty harmonics that are there as a, re uh, as a result of bad measurements. We're also going to um, perhaps compare to a baseline or alarm limits and just make sure that okay, the amplitude's high enough or that there's been enough change that warrants extra investigation. Now, step one is to identify the running speed. Hopefully that should be simple. If it's a variable speed machine, a bit more challenging. Sometimes the 1x peak can be quite small, but you might be able to pick up on a on a 8x peak or 6x peak because of, you know, number of veins or something like that. Either way, pick up the 1x peak and normalize the graph. Change the x-axis to orders, and I'll show you an example of that in, in a moment. 
Now we're going to look at, you know, has the 1x peak increased in amplitude? Is it indicating a possible fault? Well, as you may know, that could represent quite a few different fault conditions. And going off and checking the phase would be a real good idea at this point. You know, you can compare vertical to horizontal to axial if you've got the data. That would be the first step. But you may have to go back out to the machine with your two-channel analyzer and do some tests. If 2x and 3x are also high, and even 4x and 5x, but without thinking that it's a lot of harmonics and without seeing the noise floor raise up, that's also going to start me thinking about misalignments, um, cocked bearings, and other faults that can just make those peaks come up. Again, comparing axes will help. In the case of misalignment, comparing, you know, looking at axial data, radial, looking on the other side of the coupling is a good idea and seeing what sort of forces exist. But again, phase readings will help in that instance. If I see harmonics, if I'm concerned that, yes, 2x, 3x, 4x are high, but 5x, 6x, 7x, 8x, if there's a lot of peaks, then I'm going to start thinking about looseness. Maybe I'm expecting the noise floor to lift up, you know, rotating looseness, that is. Um, uh, maybe excessive clearance, maybe some rubs as well will generate that. I would take a look at the time waveform at this stage and see if there's any indications there of that sort of a fault condition. So once I've done that, um, I'm going to also think, well, how many shafts does this machine have? If it's belt-driven, got a gearbox, a fluid coupling, chain drive or something, there might be more than one shaft that I should be looking at and basically going back through this process, the motor shaft and the fan shaft and, and looking at it from that point of view. But once I've done that, I'm going to then look at the forcing frequencies themselves. So hopefully we know how many pump veins there are, how many blades, etc, uh, etc. Et there are going to be known faults, fault conditions that you can look for and that's where the wall charts and the little mouse pad and the reference guide and so on that we give you um, is very helpful because you can then say well hey let's look for little sidebands around 1x, 2x, 3x or let's look for the 6x peak to go up if that's the pump vein rate and see if twice that value is up and three times that value is up. See if there's a lot of noise underneath you know if the base of the spectrum is lifting up. Might indicate cavitation. So basically knowing what you do know about the machine, um, twice line frequency, you can figure out pole pass frequencies pretty easily, pump vein rate, gear mesh frequencies, there's a whole process you can go through. Knowing the running speed is essential. Um, knowing those frequencies is very important. If you're just getting started in vibration and thinking, oh, but I don't know how many rotor bars and how many pump veins and what the bearings are, do not stress about it. Number one, there is so much you can figure out using a little bit of this and a bit of reverse engineering on the spectrum. If you've got a pump and you can see a, you know, a fairly decent sized peak at, at six times running speed, well, you can figure out that there's probably six, six veins in that pump. The same goes with fans. Um, you can figure out the synchronous speed, and of course you know your line frequency, and um, number of rotor bars. It's, it's just not rocket science. You look for peaks, you know, rotor bars are going to have sidebands often of twice line frequency. It's just not that hard to figure these things out, even gear mesh frequencies and so on. So, even if you don't know going into it, get some spectra, look at them, and see if you can figure out the peaks from that. Okay, so then, once we know that, you know, if I see a lot of harmonics, I'm going to be thinking about, you know, distortion, about impacts and rubs and these sorts of sources of vibration that create harmonics. And the time waveform is going to be helpful. If I see the noise floor lift up, the time waveform is going to be helpful. If I see sidebands, that also makes me think along a certain line, and the time waveform can help there too. So once I've gone this far, maybe there will be other peaks that you can't explain. Just other peaks in places and you think, well, okay, we've explained the others. Now what are these? 
Please first understand that vibration analysis is very complicated. Vibration is complicated. When all those sources of vibration in the machine all interact, they combine together, they add and subtract from each other. You can have a peak in a spectrum which is at a frequency which is the addition of two other uh, sources of vibration. It's called intermodulation. Of course, you should know about sidebands and harmonics. They're going to generate peaks. You can have noise. You can have all sorts of things. So when you do see additional peaks, glance up at your x -ac at your y-axis and just make sure you're not fussing about peaks that have very low amplitude. But consider that those peaks might indicate bearing faults. So we are going to investigate that. Now, there's so much we could talk about with, with these topics, but first you're going to look at whether it's a sub, whether these peaks are sub-synchronous, lower than running speed, because there's only certain reasons that that vibration might be generated. Might be the cage rate of the bearing, might be belt wear, turbulence, external sources of vibration or, an, or another shaft. So there's some ideas. If the vibration is synchronous, in other words an integer whole number multiple of the running speed, then that's going to make you think along a certain line. Pump vanes and veins, uh, blades and all these sorts of rotating elements will have seven or eight or nine blades, but they won't have uh, four and a half, you know, won't have 4.68 blades. So when you see peaks that are synchronous, start thinking about, you know, what don't you know about the machine? Could it be the pump vein rate? Could it be a blade passing frequency? You know, think along those lines. But where it gets interesting is with the non-synchronous peaks, peaks that come up that are non-integer multiples of the running speed, 6.39 times the running speed, 4.03 times the running speed, etc. Not four times, not six times, but 4.09, 6.18, these sorts of ratios. If the machine is more complicated, then you need to make sure that it's non-synchronous with both shafts in the machine, or all three shafts, or whatever it happens to be. But as soon as you see non-synchronous frequencies, and you know it's not twice line frequency, and you feel comfortable, it's not one of these sum and difference frequencies or vibration from another machine, then definitely start thinking about bearing faults, rolling element bearing faults, assuming the machine has rolling elements, uh, rolling element bearings. Identify those peaks and see if they are separated by the running speed of either of the shafts or the shaft that the bearing's turning on. One X sidebands is an indication of a fault on the inner race of the bearing. If you see a lot of peaks that seem to be separated more closely. That could be the cage frequency, the fundamental train frequency. There could be damage on the balls. But whatever you do, look for harmonics. If you see non-synchronous peaks and see that there are harmonics of those, definitely think about the possibility of a bearing fault. The time waveform will help you. Um, and your envelope, peak view, demod, shock pole spike energy, all those sorts of measurements will help you, you know, if you suspect that. Last but certainly not least, have a think about the noise floor as well. Um, sometimes you see vibration which is basically noise and you can, well, you can discount it if the amplitude's low and it's not indicating a fault. But sometimes, for example, when bearings are in late stage of failure, they generate so much noise that they excite resonances and the base of the, the machine, the base of the spectrum, starts lifting up. The noise floor lifts up. When you have looseness, um, extreme bearing faults, which usually results in looseness, when you have rubs, when you have bursts of noise like in turbulence and cavitation, you tend to, instead of creating sharp peaks, you tend to create broad areas of vibration. Something to think about is that resonances can amplify vibration a great deal. So before you go jumping to any conclusions because a peak seems to be higher in amplitude than you expected, have a think about the fact that there could be a resonance amplifying the vibration. 
the, the machine may be generating more vibration than before. There may be some sort of a fault condition, but you may be misled because that source of vibration is being uh, amplified greatly. You may see a peak, but it may be a harmonic. Harmonics are affected by resonances as well. So it may be the third or fourth harmonic of the running speed that's being amplified. You might say, why have I got this great big you know, 4x peak or 5x peak or something like that? Well, have a look at the bottom. See if it seems to be sort of raised up. Look at it in log. Look for that big hump. It could indicate that a resonance is being excited or natural frequency is being excited. It's resonating and that could be the reason. So, you know, the time waveform can help you um, Using a bit of this to think about what the machine is going through can sure help as well. And let's not forget that the only reason anyone is paying you to do vibration analysis is because they want a report from you to say what they have to do. They don't want to see amplitudes and spectra and phase readings and all this sort of stuff. You know, yeah, put it in the back of the report if you really feel the need. The fact is that most people just want to know, do I need to take any action? What action is it and how urgent is it? You need to tell them straight. Tell them, oh, the vibration's high, it's not going to really help them. So make a recommendation. Make sure anyone who needs that recommendation receives the recommendation. Follow up to make sure that they've received it. They may choose not to take any action. They might say, yep, that bearing's looking bad, but man, we have to keep production going. We will risk that bearing failing. We've got to keep production going. That's fine. But also follow up in terms of determining whether you got the diagnosis right. So if they did work on the machine, see if you got it right. See if you got the severity right, the fault condition right. See if there's anything else wrong with the machine. Then, as I mentioned at the beginning, root cause failure analysis. You're only doing half your job if all you do there is keep finding the same bearings failing and the same machines that are out of balance and misaligned and everything else. You have the power to see why the bearings are failing. Um, you can go back in a very friendly way and say, we need to change this about the way we're installing the bearings or storing the bearings, or lubricating the bearings. And I could go through a thousand examples. There is a root cause reason why the machine failed. And you have data that can help determine what that is. If you go back and help people change the way they're being trained and educated so that they balance the machine properly, align the machine properly, lubricate the machine properly, then you'll see fewer faults. Your job will still be very valuable, it's just that the company will be actually making some more money instead of wasting it on unnecessary um, downtime and, and maintenance work and so on. And, and get feedback in that process, actually see if people are, you know, have made the changes in their, in their processes. You know, there's so much we could talk about on this particular topic. Let's have a look at the spectrum analysis process. Here we've got a, a blower. It's you know, a slightly more complicated machine, and it's silly going through a real simple one, I suppose, but we know that the normal RPM is about 1800 RPM, and it's got a couple of, you know, it's got two lobes you know, as the blower. So we start with the spectrum, and we see a series of peaks, and we see, you know, the x axis right now is in CPM. Now, I can look at that, and I can start jumping to conclusions, I can start thinking that I see patterns in there. And if, you're so, if you've entered lots of information into your software, it may be able to you know, drop lines down and, and show you, oh, this is this frequency, that's that frequency, this is this shaft, that shaft. But let's just go through the analysis process. First, I'm going to try and identify the 1x peak. And I say, right, I knew that the RPM, it's a induction motor so it's going to be slightly less than the nominal 1800 so um, there's the running speed peak and it's just a bit less than 1800 rpm so that's great so i'm going to look at that amplitude and say hey is that normal you know is that uh, does that indicate unbalance or something like that um, then i'm going to look at the multiples so notice what i've done to the graph scale 
I've, I've now my grid is aligned with 1x, 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x. It is easier to look at this graph now because I see that some peaks are related to the running speed and some are not. Um, so that, that helps me a lot. Now, from that I can identify which peaks are actually multiples of the running speed. And these were the only substantial ones that were, or at least this, this and this. Now, in this case, I happen to know that the uh, blower itself runs slightly higher speed, 1.22 times the running speed, which is this peak here. Now, depending on your software, you may now be able to click on this peak, identify it is at a, as a shaft rate, and then renormalize the graph to that, so that 1x appears under here, 2x there, 3x, 4x, 5x, etc. You may be able to do that. Um, if you can't, um, too bad. You just keep doing it the way we're doing it now. Anyway, so identify that frequency and then look at twice that value. Oh, sorry. Right now I'm just looking at the blower shaft rate. Then I look at the harmonics and I see, ooh, I've got my 2x vibration is quite high. 3x is quite low, 4x is quite high, 5x, 6x, 7x, 8x. And all that's very interesting. But then I consider, oh, wait a minute, you know, I've got a low blower here. I expect to see high vibration at 2x. This would be one of my forcing frequencies. 2x, and there's twice that frequency, three times that frequency. It's also not unusual to get harmonics with this sort of a machine. So, yep, I've got some harmonics there. You know, so far so good, I've identified a number of the peaks. During this process, as I say, you know, if we found that one was particularly high, we would consider unbalance, misalignment, looseness, bench shaft, eccentricity, these sorts of things, and I might use phase. But then I'll move on, and I'll move on, and I'll move on, and sort of work through even if I believe that there is an unbalanced fault, it doesn't mean to say that there's not also a bearing fault or something else. So, here's my 2x frequency, 4x, 6x, 8x from the lobes. But notice I've got some other peaks down here in the spectrum that I haven't accounted for yet. If I was to toggle to log, by the way, I would see those much more clearly. But let's just stick with linear for the minute. So I toggle to log and I see, yep, all these peaks here, they're sub-synchronous. And um, I've got you know, a, a series of harmonics. And that's common with belt rate. Now, belt, belt wear, that's the belt rate frequency. Now, even if I didn't know what my belt rate frequency was, which you can calculate knowing the length of the belt or the distance between the two sheaves and all this sort of thing, um, the fact is when I see something like that sort of a pattern, you know, it's not jumping to too much of a conclusion to decide that that's probably the source of the vibration. Um, so, we've identified those peaks now. And what I'm doing here, notice, and it depends how you do it with your software, is I am marking off the peaks. You know, marking them off. I'm accounting for each one. Because having done that, it now makes it so much easier to see this peak and this peak, you know, this peak, this peak, you know, I, and, and this one in here. I can see peaks there now, which before were just another tree in a forest. Now they stand out more clearly. Now how you do it in your software is up to you. I've even seen people with you know, whiteboard markers mark them off on their computer screen and then sort of wipe it off afterwards. But the software should give you the tools to, to do that. Now, next thing, you know, what is this peak? Well, it happens to be just higher than 4x. Our motor is a two-pole motor. In this instance, it was in the USA, which is 120 hertz. So that is our twice line frequency vibration. So we can mark that one off too and say, right, now we've explained it. But that leaves this one. We haven't explained this one yet. And I notice that when I look at this one and look at twice that frequency and, and three times that frequency, maybe I've got some harmonics there. And that's going to make me think about bearing fault. Um, 
Again, I would flick this over to log because these peaks would look much more obvious. These other little peaks might represent sidebands of different sorts. You know, log is good and there's another little mini presentation on why. But anyway, so we can look at the machine and you know, we, we look at these, these gears, uh, the timing gears and how they mesh and uh, other potential sources of vibration and think, do I see everything in the first 10 orders of vibration? Nuh uh. Um, instead, I'll look at higher frequencies. I can see a bit of a resonance going on here. I can see, you know, additional peaks in this area which I'd like to analyze. And I can see, you know, here, these might be, um, you know, related to broken rotor bars or something like that. This is my motor pass, ro motor rotor bar passing frequency and sidebands of twice line frequency. Um, so, again, having a uh, a low F max and a high F max has been very useful in this case rather than trying to analyze all this stuff down here with just one spectrum out to 70 or 80 or 90 orders um, or 100 in this case you know I, I'd rather look at this one for this sort of analysis and that one for that sort of analysis anyway you know, a few tips first don't be fooled by resonances You'll sometimes see peaks that seem extraordinarily high in amplitude, or even not extraordinary, just higher in amplitude. Look at the base and make sure they're not being amplified. It still indicates a fault condition, it's just the severity is different. Um, watch the amplitude scale, particularly if you're in linear. You can see peaks and think, oh my goodness, what are all these peaks? And then you look across and the amplitude is very, very low. As I've said a few times, the log scale in the amplitude um, axis, y-axis, will reveal things to you that you can miss completely otherwise. And, you know, just when you're analyzing the harmonics and sidebands, you might find sometimes that the harmonics don't quite line up. There are techniques to have the software focus in on the peak and, and make sure the harmonics do line up. Sometimes people jump to conclusions, they see uh, the harmonics don't line up and they think, whoa, what is this vibration? No, they really are harmonics, it's just you need to fine-tune the frequency um, a little better. Anyway, the more you understand about why the vibration changes, the more of a chance you've got to diagnose the fault. So think like the machine. When you see the noise floor change, you see harmonics and sidebands, when you see different frequencies, Think about the machine and think, why would the vibration change in that way? You can look at the wall charts all you like. They give you an indication of the sorts of patterns you should go looking for, but don't expect that your spectrum is going to look anything like those wall chart spectra. It just doesn't work that way. But you need a systematic approach. You know, validate your data, normalize it. Just check those low orders for misalignment, unbalanced eccentricity, cock bearing, bent shaft and so on. Look for your forcing frequencies and see if you've got harmonics and sidebands. Figure out which are your unidentified peaks you know, and consider the different possible reasons why that might be. Then write clear recommendations. Make sure you are closing the loop with good recommendations, doing root cause failure analysis and so on. Anyway, I hope this, pro, uh, this, this presentation has been helpful. Um, feel free, of course, to look at it again. You might want to pause it at places and replay bits of it. That's up to you. Thanks for viewing this presentation. I do hope it's been helpful.